Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech, the military in Hawaii at, at the 2 p.m. on Thursday. Here we are. And uh, we're talking about the Hawaii Air National Guard. Let's take a look at the Hawaii Air National Guard. It's important that we understand our military, what's here, what's there, how they operate, what they're like as people. Ooh, ooh, important. Okay. So we have today um, um, Kevin Hort Horton. Um, That's right. He, yeah. He's on the left side of the screen, and uh, we have Paul Lopez. He's on the right side of the screen. And uh, can can you give us your ranks, you guys, because I can't read it from here. Hey Jay, welcome. Thanks for thanks for having us here today. We're so glad to be with you. You got uh, Lieutenant Colonel Horton on the on the uh, left side, and then Lieutenant Colonel Lopez on the right side here. We represent the fifteenth uh, and one fifty fourth wing the Hawaii National Guard and the active duty Air Force Station at Hickam Air Force Base. So does that mean you're active duty or are you part time? Great question. So we are both. Uh, Loco is what he, we like to call him Loco. Uh, they call me Magoo. Uh, we are, we're, he is active duty and I am a guardsman stationed here in Hawaii. So uh, we work together as a total force team. That's what we call TFI. Uh, so we really kind of leverage the strengths of both of the organizations to provide air power to the United States Air Force, wherever they need us, anytime, any place. Okay, um, gee, I'm so curious. Uh, you're, you're in flight suits, it looks like. And that means yeah. you're, ready to, you're ready to stand up and you might stand up right in the middle of the show and, and dash off for a flight, am I right? You're ready to go, aren't you? We're ready to go. If, you, if the screen goes blank, you'll know what happened. We got called to duty and uh, we'll be back with you when we can. Okay, so what what uh, what aircraft are you qualified on? Big ones, little ones, medium sized ones? It'll go. Yep. So here at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, and then primarily at Hickam Air Force Base, we have F twenty two Raptors fighter jets. We also have KC one thirty five uh, tankers that we do air refueling with. We also have C seventeen Globemasters to help us get that global reach for logistics across the world. And we also have uh, C thirty sevens for DV airlift as well. Are you qualified on all of those? That'd be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> I think that'd be awesome. I think that the concept of flight to where if you're whatever you're flying, if you pull back, the airplane goes up. If you push forward, the airplane goes down. You move your left hand forward, the plane goes faster, pull it back, it goes slower. So I think I think we probably could fly all the airplanes, but both of us are current and qualified in the F-22 Raptor. Oh, the Raptor. Wow. That, you know, wow. A couple of thoughts about that. You know, I knew I knew a fellow who was a pilot, the Air National Guard, and uh, he said those things go straight up, like 90 degrees straight up into the sky, straight up vertical. Is that true? Uh, we can absolutely do that. Uh, we generally hold about 60 degrees in Ohio and take off at the maximum, but it's an amazing airplane. Oko was a demonstration pilot for the, F, uh, for the F-22 for the United States Air Force. So uh, he had the uh, honor and privilege of being able to fly across the nation in air shows. So he's one of the most capable uh, pilots in this in this airplane. He can do that type of stuff. You know, my, pardon me, but I do have a lot of questions for you, Paul. Um, uh, or is it Lopo? Lopo? Loco. Loco. L Loco. I was trying to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's it like to fly in an air show you have to be very precise and and uh, you know you have to have a good night's sleep beforehand and be very totally alert right uh yes sir that's right jay and i tell you what um it is just pure exhilaration um the cool thing is that you find that you're embedded with a team of phenomenal airmen from our total force service from air national guard airmen to reservists to active duty airmen that come together to showcase American air power. One of the cool things about being on a demonstration team is that you get a chance to share not only your own story, but also the story of other airmen, you know, like Lieutenant Colonel Horton or from our PA airmen, from our security forces defenders, and more importantly, for the maintainers who truly have a near and dear place to any operator's heart because without them, we wouldn't have airplanes to fly. You bet. Ooh. And, uh, and um... Kevin, you, uh, uh, no, it's not. It's not Kevin. It's, it's. Uh, what's your nickname again? Uh, they call me Magoo. Magoo. This is Magoo, like uh, like Mister Magoo. Like it's Mr. like Magoo. Tom Cruise. You get a special name, right? <laughs> what do you guys have uh, a special get, name? <laughs> we don't get the cool call signs though. They name us whatever they want to name us. <laughs> so uh, you you fly these planes? Um, you know, these planes are fighters, aren't they? Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm yeah, and, yeah and, absolutely. So we uh, we have 
we have uh, 24 uh, F-22 stations for Harbor Hickam. Obviously, we uh, work in the Indo-Pacific uh, theater, but they are fighter planes. They're the most capable airplanes in the world. Uh, and they really are an amazing uh, feat of American technology. It, it represents a lot for us personally. Obviously, we take great pride in them, how they maintain them and how we fly with them is a, a big portion of what we do. But we're really here working for you uh, and, the, and the state of Hawaii. So that's that's really our mission. And uh, we take a lot of pride in it. And obviously, we enjoy having such a capable airplane. But we're, we're here as uh, citizens and, and uh, as military members supporting the national defense strategy and doing whatever we can to make uh, this country the best we can. Well, we want you to do that, especially now. You know, I think um, anybody who watches uh, the Ukraine conflict, I shouldn't say conflict, I'll just say invasion, that's what I'll say, um, knows how important fighter planes are. If we didn't know before, <laughs> we certainly learned over the past few weeks how much in demand they are and the kinds of things yes, they sir. can do and um, the kinds of things they can do to stop the other guy. So I think I think the world has taken note over the last only the last few weeks about the importance and the high tech qualities and the systems on fire fighter plane. So you said uh, th that the Raptor is the best uh, fighter in the world. Is it better than the Russian fighters? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we definitely take a lot of pride in our jet being the best. And just to highlight on that last point that you made, it, I think sometimes we forget that American air superiority is as something we've earned. So the last time that any troops took um, uh, any type of attack from the air in the United States Air Force is April 15, 1953. So as fighter pilots, that's something that we take very, very uh, seriously. And air superiority is crucial in any type of campaign that we have. And it's certainly one of the strengths of the United States Air Force. And our pilots are uh, very well equipped. We're very well trained. And we certainly are looking, uh, uh, we are ready to do whatever tasking is we're asked by the United States Air Force and, and the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Well, who knows what will happen? You know, uh, hopefully I mean, not, but we're ready. <laughs> yeah, well, but you know, but there's all these threats coming from Russia, and and uh, and of course the administration doesn't want to get into a shooting war, but but the reality is that remains a possibility. So you can wake up in the morning one morning and and get a special call, and um, you might have to go east fast. Sure. You know? uh, the 15th and the 154th wing is ready for our nation's call whenever that may come, and hopefully, obviously, we don't want that to happen, but we're ready whenever, uh, whenever we're needed. So what, you know, one thing that interests me is, um, you know, there are all kinds of variations on the theme about how you would get these, uh, you know, MiGs that are somehow mm, around Europe into Ukraine. And I say to myself, or even from Latin America, uh, I say to myself, gee, does, does a fighter plane have a kind of range? Can you cross the world in a fighter plane? Um, oh. By the way, I remember during Vietnam, Zaps Latiper, a Navy pilot, an admiral, he was very senior admiral, he's retired, of course, now. Um, we asked him, um, I think it was on, yeah, it was on July 4th, we were celebrating July 4th, and we said, what's the most extraordinary experience you ever had as a fighter plane pilot? And he said, well, they told me to ferry a fighter plane from the east coast of Vietnam, and I did. I guess he had a stop on the West Coast or somewhere because I didn't think the range was that that far. He said, as I was crossing the country, following the sun at sunset, and it was getting dark into the evening as I was flying, I could see below me the fireworks all across the country. It was like watching the biggest fireworks display you could ever imagine in your whole life. He said, it touched my heart as I watched all these cities and towns all along the way doing their fireworks on July 4th. <laughs> Never forget that. Yeah, what a, what a story that was. But, you know, it, it, it opens the question of, you know, what, what, how far can you fly with a fighter plane? You can't fly around the world, right? Got that one. Yeah. So, Jay, uh, Fighter jets come with just like cars where you may have a large fuel tank or a small fuel tank. But I think one of the cool things about being in the military, um, as well as with our, sister, with our sister services, that we all have tankers that help extend the range for the fighter jets. Um, so a fighter jet can typically fly anywhere from about 500 to 1,200 
uh, miles before they'll need to land and get gas, or they can stay airborne for an extended period of time. For example, we have the ability through global reach, global power, and global logistics to fly all the way from here to Japan, which is like 10 to 11 uh, hours in the jet, which is a couple of thousand miles. So that's just part of the capability that we're able to bring to the fight. Oh, that's really, that's important. So that if you, if you had to go to a distant theater, you could go without too much trouble. You might have to land somewhere for fuel. Um, are these, are these, no, uh, sorry, say? No, we actually have the uh, tanker squadron that's located here at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. They can provide air to air capability. So we refuel airborne uh, and can go unlimited amount of range based on their ability to, to refuel us. So what's it like flying a fighter plane? It must be one of the most thrilling experiences in the world. You probably say every second to yourself, you say, what a blessing that I, I'm a human being who can do this. I'm, I'm one in a hundred thousand that can actually do this thing. It must be a real thrill, eh? I'll let Loco cover that one, but I'll tell you that we are very blessed. Go ahead. Yeah, I would say it's just a humbling opportunity. You know, it's definitely a privilege and an honor to put on this uniform. I like to refer to it as like putting on our superhero outfit and turning into Superman or Superwoman because we have men and women from various and diverse backgrounds that um, are privileged to serve our country and to be a part of the team and to fulfill our role of uh, flying these high performance multi-million dollar airplanes and train. That way we're ready as uh, Magoo talked about being ready whenever our nation calls on us to execute the mission. But I mean, when you think about it, like we're able to fly faster than the speed of sound in flying fighter jets, you know, which means you're able to go faster than 10 miles a minute. Um, and that was a big deal back in the day when uh, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. But every time we fly, we have that ability to go faster than the speed of sound. But then also we have our uh, air refueling pilots where they, they are flying around and they are extending our ability to do more training airborne by passing us gas in the air. And I think when you think about that, you have two airplanes going about 300 to 350 miles an hour, about four miles high in the sky and transferring gas through a boom from one aircraft to another. I'm like, that is amazing. And not only do we do that in the daytime, Jay, we do that in the nighttime. Oh. And also we can do that in the nighttime in the clouds, which is like, whoa, you know, <laughs> a pretty crazy environment. But then we'd also have the ability to integrate with our C-17 uh, warfighters as well and get a chance to learn about their missions to where they can fly low, fly fast do uh, assault landings or even drop down their ramp and get that unobstructed, unopposed view of the world while sending out the, like uh, some of our sister service members, sending the army out the back, uh, sending tanks out the back during airdrops and doing things of that nature, or even getting a chance to see that uh, premier service in flight with our DV airlift team uh, with the 65th airlift squadron. So it's just amazing, not only flying the airplane, but realizing the team that we're a part of. You know, if you ever feel lonesome up there, would you give me a call? I'll come up and sit behind you, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> Might not be able to help, but I'll, I'll sure be enthusiastic, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> so how often do you have to train to stay current? How often do you have to train to be up on it and ready? Uh, our, our, our training program is robust, and certainly our young pilots, they'll fly up to like 15 times a month. Uh, just because it takes a lot of repetition. It's, it's like a professional sport in a lot of ways, as I describe it, is the preparation that it takes, the, uh, the teamwork, and then also the uh, debrief. We'll, you know, we'll focus on an hour brief and discuss it. They'll probably have studied a couple day, uh, day or so before. Uh, and then there's a brief given for an hour. Uh, and then you go execute the mission. And then we come back, it may be eight to 12 hours, but just focusing in on the, on the minutia of that, of that sortie to really get the most learning out of it. And the Air Force has a great technique uh, for being able to teach us. Uh, and we have the, the longevity and the, the great instructors. We have the most instructors, pilots in the uh, in any F-22 squadron uh, between the 19th and the 199th fighter squadron here on uh, the joint base. So we really have a, a great ability and it really just depends on your, on your, on how old you are, how young you are in that. Get to fly as much as we're mostly talking to people like you and, and taking care of our airmen, but uh, Overall, we uh, we fly 15 times a month for the young for the young pilots. How about your eyes? You know, if I was up there yeah. you know, in the cockpit <laughs> behind you, um, I, I I don't think I could see very well because um, yeah. I'm old. I'm old. Yeah. But what happens when a pilot can't see as well as he used to see? 
we don't talk about sensitive subjects like that, especially as you get to be <laughs> we keep that we keep that stuff far away from us. You know, you could show up on the tarmac one day with with some some glasses on and see what the commander says. <laughs> Yeah, that would be terrible. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, what's interesting, Jay, is that I think that's a testament to American air power and innovation and ingenuity because these aircraft that we fly are very sophisticated with modern technology, and we have radars in the front of the fighter jets, so we have the ability to see other aircraft at a beyond visual range as well. One misconception is that you have to have 2020 eyesight to be, if you have any interest in flying, to be in the military, but you don't. Um, as long as your vision is correctable to 2020 weather, because we have pilots who fly wearing glasses and pilots who fly wearing contact lenses. So uh, for any, uh, any young people out there, young and old, they, uh, a desire to want to be a part of the world's greatest Air Force, you know, we're looking for some, uh, some members to join our team. I think we're going to get a from Jay. Get from Jay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> I'll go everywhere, everywhere, anywhere that the Air Force wants me to go, but um, just like you. But uh, but let me ask. I mean, uh, um, you know, what are the general physical specs uh, that the Air Force is going to require of a fighter pilot? It's not everybody qualifies. Uh, what what you know? Is it better if I'm a big athlete? Is it better if I'm strong as an ox? Is it, you know, what what do I need to be and do and study if I want to get the job? Great, great question. So really the main thing that is uh, not a physical attribute is really your heart and your willingness to put in the effort. Because like I mentioned before, it is a professional sport in a lot of ways and it takes a, a commitment. There's a lot of cool in the things that we get to do, but it, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that's just you know plain hard to do and a lot of work. And you have to be self-motivated, you have to be disciplined. And certainly the Air Force has a good way to get you there, but you have to have the desire an urge to get better every day. And not everyone's cut out for that to be able to say, hey, I could do better. Here's something I can improve on. And that's really the, the goodness of what the Air Force brings because not only do we have that here, we have that in, across the and across the country of just airmen who want to be the best at what they do. Physically, uh, there's a lot of variance that is acceptable and they have a process in the beginning when you get, when you put your application in to see if you're qualified. You know, uh, and, and most people are, to be honest, it's not as uh, rigorous as one might think, but the training is very rigorous and, uh, and you really have to have a heart for it uh, and a desire to serve your country and a desire to kind of sacrifice. And, and certainly uh, it's, it's not without sacrifice and our families are really the ones who, you know, I think about my family and what they give me and how much they support us. And it is an, a super important aspect of it to have that complete concept because the Ohanas and the families are not behind you it's impossible to do our mission correctly. So hopefully that answered somewhat of your question, but it's a pretty big, it's a pretty wide net overall. It does, but it also evokes a lot of other questions. So oh, wow. um, <laughs> is it true, is it true that, that pilots, especially fighter pilots, are able to um, um, put their, their, their pants on one leg at a time? <laughs> You got that one. Actually, oh, Jay, we levitate. We, we levitate into them. <laughs> it's a different. It, you have to have a different mindset, and it's not just while you're flying. It's it's in life. You have to see things differently. Am I right? It's a it's a special profession that calls for a special lens, so to speak, um, on the world, on on how you interact with the world and the machinery and and the country, for that matter. Is true. I, I would I would definitely agree with that. It is a uh, it is a calling in the beginning, and then the Air Force kind of trains you to be able to do that. And you really need to be able to compartmentalize. That's probably the one and most important thing that I would say. And it it is really a good aspect of just in in life uh, because there's a lot of bad in the world. There's a lot of good in the world, and really how you choose to focus on that good and bad change it changes your perspective. So we're taught early on when we fail to forget it quickly because the airplane is not stopping for you to get that right. You are on to the next, the next problem. So we certainly fail a lot, but we get up quickly and then you're quickly to forget it and keep that confidence that, hey, the next time you're gonna do better and learn from that. And that corporate uh, culture of just the Air Force is a way that we improve and that way the tenacity that we bring to it is really the difference that makes us a, a force to be reckoned with across the world. Uh, so I certainly do think it does change you. You certainly have to have a, a very unique uh, view of life, 
a lot of that the Air Force gives you, but ultimately the desire to serve and the love for this country is what's going to drive you to that spot. Yeah, sometimes we forget uh, how important patriotism is. I mean, I, you know, as you mentioned, I was in the service. I, I carry that every day in my life. I'm, I'm so completely, totally patriotic. I know you guys are too. So, uh, you know, the, the, the question also is if you're, if you're a pilot, and not only in the Air Force, but in the Navy as well, um, that distinguishes you uh, for promotion. It distinguishes you for flag officer. Um, doesn't it? I mean, I, you know, in the Coast Guard, if you were a pilot, you were golden. You, you, were, <laughs> you were on the way to heaven, literally. And, um, and so, um, you know, a lot of the flag officers were, well, a lot of them were ship drivers, of course, but a good number of them were pilots. It, it was a great career track. Is that, is that true in the Air Force, too? Uh, no, Jay, I would say that uh, starting out in the Air Force, you know, it all starts with the core values of excellence in all we do. And that's what the Air Force ingrains in all of our uh, warfighters is that regardless of your job, do it to the best of your ability. And that's going to help make you competitive for promotion. Um, you know, one of the couple of sayings in the Air Force, one of them being that our mission is to fly, fight and win in airspace and cyberspace. So it's all about how well are you executing the mission by doing your job? How well are you being a team player by leading the end? How well are you managing resources? And are you improving the unit that you're a part of as well? Um, I think that sometimes when people think about the Air Force, they think that all we do is fly. And you know, one of those visual symbols is the flight suit. But nowadays, you have pilots that are wearing the OCP uniform or um, uh, trying to think what the OCP stands like operational camouflage pattern, a uniform to fly as well. So yeah. now it's, it's kind of changing that mental model and it's no longer, there's nothing that gives you, that makes a pilot better than anybody else. We're all here because we want to be a part of the greatest team or serve the greatest Air Force. So everybody's important from the security forces defenders the, defending the gate to the men and women that are cooking food in the dining facility. Because if your crew chief has a bad meal, they're going to be on the flight line <laughs> and you're there they, and you know you want them to be happy when they're servicing your airplane you want your pilots to be happy to have a good to have a great building to work out of that civil engineering may work in so everybody's important and the air force has a great job in highlighting um that everybody contributes to the team that no member of the team is important to anybody else because the sum of us uh as a team is greater than us as individuals yeah, I think that's one of the things that's going to be on the final exam. Um, make sure your crew chief is happy. Um, make sure he's well fed. This is very, very important for for your own for your own job. So, um, actually, uh, you know, Loco, you, you you were you were talking about operations, but you are the operations director uh, of the wing, right? Can you can you talk about what it means to be operations director? Yep, so I'm one of the director of operations for the Hawaiian Raptors, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Horn is one of the commanders for the Hawaiian Raptors. So the commander sets the vision, and essentially I am helping to oversee and facilitate daily operations to ensure that we are uh, aligning with the bosses and the commander's vision to look for individual readiness, unit readiness, and training opportunities. So that includes making sure that Warfighters are that we create an environment to where we remove any obstacles to their training to try to provide an environment that's going to have them prepared for if our nation uh, calls on us. And that's across the organization for both wings and for all the other flying units, as well as every organization has a, a, a commander as well as a director of operations. How much, uh, how much of what Paul said uh, do you agree with, Kevin? Above, above what uh, he's executing. Our, our vision, and then I'm ex I'm executing the wing commander's vision for the 15th and 154th wing, and they're working for the PACAF commander and then uh, Indo-Pacific uh, overall uh, commander, as well as the national defense strategy. That's really what makes this whole thing works is that we have a central vision, we have a mission, we have a plan, uh, and then everybody at each phase of this plan has to have their side of it and how they contribute to that. And ultimately, that's the that is the the vision that keeps us going. Without a vision, the people perish. And certainly, uh, we have great commanders. We have great leaders in this country. We are uh, still the greatest nation in the world. We all have our problems, 
Uh, but we are so proud to be Americans. We're so proud to serve this country. And we really just take those that vision and turn it into how do we support that uh, from the top down? And that's really what makes it, that's what makes the magic work. The team work together. We take, we put ourselves aside. We focus in on the team. We don't care who gets the credit for it between the 154th and 15th wing. That total force is really the only way it works is if we can put the, the mission first, put the vision at the top of that, and then uh, execute with, with uh, vengeance and with a lot of enthusiasm. Whenever you're flying, whatever the aircraft is, you're up there and there's a certain risk that something will fail or you will fail and you'll be out of the sky and killed. Um, Cause I mean, there's, there's, it's not a compromise. Um, and so I, I wonder how you deal with that as a, as a pilot or other pilots, how they deal with it. Uh, you know, right now, for example, we see tremendous courage among the people, you know, in Ukraine, and they will tell you they're going to fight no matter what. And uh, it, it doesn't matter if they get killed. Um, how do you deal with that if you're up there in the sky and you're at risk all the time, the whole time you're flying? How do you deal with that? I think one key word, Jay, is trust. You know, every day we come to work trusting and knowing in our heart of hearts that everyone who plays a part in the team to get those airplanes airborne has done their job to the best of their ability, that they're competent, they're knowledgeable, and they've been trained correctly. And that they are not going to cut corners, but follow the TO and adhere to uh, the guidance. And sometimes there are times where we do have to take uh, some operational risk to uh, achieve the mission. But before we accept that risk, we look how, do, how are we going to mitigate that risk? Or how are we going to transfer that risk? Um, I think every pilot doesn't think about uh, getting killed when they fly because there's an inherent risk in everything you do. I mean, even if you go and ride your bike on the sidewalk or walking across the street, there's a chance that something may happen uh, from a wayward driver. So when we're flying, we believe that we are sitting on the best ejection seats that the industry has to offer and that those, those ejection seats have been serviced and maintained by our phenomenal egress equipment technicians and our air crew flight equipment specialists. So in your worst case scenario on your worst day, if you do have to eject out of the aircraft, you know, due to safety reasons or to preserve your own life, that you believe that that equipment is gonna keep you safe to get you to, on the ground safely or get you in the water safely as well. Yeah, well, that really, that does answer my question. I had one other question I wanted to pose to you. Um, and that is, we have two, wings here don't we have the the 15th wing and we have the 154th wing of the hawaii air national guard um, and it reminds me of uh, when i asked you the difference between uh, um, uh, 1971 and uh, 2022 you were immediate you did the math uh, so if i do the math between the 15th wing and the 154th wing um, i get a difference of a hundred and 39. I get a difference of 139. So what happened to the other 139 wings? I need to know where they went. <laughs> That's a great question. I'm sure there's going to be a congressional inquiry into that. We'll figure it out. <laughs> the, the missing 139 wings. <laughs> Why are they named that way? Uh, you know, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I know uh, from, the, uh, from the 15th wing, obviously they are an active duty wing. Uh, Colonel Dobbles is a commander here on the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Uh, and then we have the 154th Wing with Brigadier, Brigadier General Carlson is the uh, Hank, uh, the uh, 154th Wing commander. So the 154th Wing in itself is the, a guard unit here. And we are actually the largest Air National Guard wing in the entire nation. We have about 2,500 people. Uh, we certainly do support the state uh, with our uh, reporting to the governor. And then we're also ready for federal service if needed to by the president of the United States. Uh, so, and then the 15th wing, those are active duty servicemen and women who are stationed here and they uh, uh, cycle in and out. Uh, but we work together as a team because there's a lot of, of uh, strengths that we can leverage from both of us, i.e. that they have a lot of, of excited people, a lot of energy that comes in. Uh, we also have a lot of people that have been here a long time that can help train those uh, new airmen that may show up with a new, a new task. Uh, and then they also have uh, uh, a lot of support uh, from the uh, from PACF here. So it really is a it is a teamwork uh, situation, uh, total force. 
it, it is some work, but it is worth it because of, of the strengths that we bring to the game. And it really is not a difficult problem if you can keep that mission that we talked about in mind. Uh, things kind of just solve themselves. So what is an ACE? I have a, a question here I'm going to ask. What is an ACE and why is it important? Is that an ACE pilot like in World War I or is <laughs> it something else? Important, but you, you got this. <laughs> I know you're yeah, both yeah. ACE so, pilots. Uh, I know that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, and for the viewers out there, they may be wondering what is an ACE? Well, an ACE in aerial combat is once you shoot down uh, five aircraft that you become an ACE. But in the Air Force, that term ACE is an acronym for Agile Combat Employment. And it's kind of going back to the basics of what we used to do back in the World War era, where we would try to operate from different locations other than your main operating location. That way, you just have options to project, enable, and employ that combat power. Well, I have one last area I'd like to cover with you guys, and that is this. Um, you know, what is the difference between the you know, regular Air Force and the Air National Guard? What is it like in one and the other? And do you, do you talk to them? They talk to you? Do you talk nice? Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, do you talk often? And do you compare notes and collaborate on all the things that we have been discussing here today? Or are you in different silos in any way? Well, there's obviously always barriers to break down in any, any, any walk of life. But in our organization, we are man from and uh, we have men and women from both uh components that work together in the same building and we kind of adapted the we have the 19th fighter squadron the 199th fighter squadron those are the two units but we really uh the the, the people who set up this organization back in 2010 when we got the f-22 raptor initially uh, they had a vision where we basically uh, the way we did that was under the hawaiian raptors was the low was the name and we kind of adopted the uh king kamehameha uh, uh silhouette because he united the Hawaiian Islands uh, and uh, we figured that if he could do that for that, he could also unite us. So we really worked hand in hand, uh, day in, day out. Uh, most people can't tell the difference when they walk in our squadron of whom is uh, of what component. Uh, and there's always things, there's always different challenges. Anytime you meet somebody who's from a different walk of life with a different perspective, the, the key is, is being open-minded to understand that not everything you know is correct and not everything you're doing is the right way to do it. Uh, you have to be open to other people's visions, other people's ideas. And that is really the strength that, of the Hawaiian Raptors is because we are open to those ideas, even if they're not your own. Uh, and certainly we are accommodating to those. And it, it really is just a lesson in life. If, if you want to be as good as you uh, can be, you have to be willing to adapt. You have to be able to listen. You have to be able to take criticism and be able to work together. And I, I think that's really what the uh, Hawaiian Raptors are about. Uh, and certainly the team that Moco, uh, and his active duty counterparts bring, we couldn't, we would not be as good as we are without them. And I, I like to think the same uh, for them. So I think that teamwork is really what, where the magic is uh, and keeping the perspective of the mission in mind. Now, what about, what about the Navy? We haven't talked about the Navy. I told you about uh, Admiral uh, Zlatiper. <laughs> and, um, and he was definitely a pilot, fighter pilot. Um, the, does the Navy and the Air Force, do they talk together? Do, do, Absolutely. Uh, do, are they better than you or are you better than them? Wow. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're trying to get us in trouble. I think, I think this is on the list of things I was not supposed to say. <laughs> but you know, we'll, we'll leave that open to your viewers to be able to make the determination. But I certainly couldn't do it without the joint force, right? I mean, that's again a piece of, of what makes America America is it's not just fighter planes it's not just boats uh, there's all types of, of walks and and every layer is covered from uh, from top to bottom and it's the same like-minded people so uh, we cannot win any wars without the Navy and uh, we certainly like to provide that air security that we talked about earlier as well so we feel like that we bring we contribute to the fight uh, and we uh, look forward to working to them whenever we need to. Okay, last question. I, I like your views, uh, the views of each of you, actually. If you would please express to our young viewers um, why, why they might consider joining the Air Force, or for that matter, the Navy, uh, with a view toward uh, being a pilot or being involved in, you know, aircraft and, um, you know, air training and, and um, you know, all the things that our various aircraft do uh, from maintenance to pilot. Um, why should they do that? Could you tell me what you think the Air Force or the Air National Guard offers to young people who, you know, might might want to consider that in our time? Okay, so Kevin, you first. 
Okay, well, Loco is an expert on this, but I'll tell you the thing that I, I really uh, think is the most important piece is for people who want to be better and to be the best version of themselves that they can be, I certainly think the Air Force is the way. I mean, flying jets is awesome. But, you know, the real piece that makes and makes me uh, keep waking up every morning to do this job is the teamwork that I have and the uh, ability to improve. And that that piece that you're going to find that kind of the locker locker room uh, feel, if you will, of just knowing that that's your team, they've got your back. You're not going to you're not going to replicate that in the uh, in the civilian world. And I think that is the, the most important thing uh, is that obviously, you know, you're serving your country, you're flying a cool airplane. Uh, but ultimately the team, you know, your brothers and sisters to your left and right, that's why you do the job. Uh, and that's what keeps me coming back and why I, 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 love, uh, I love what I do. Uh, Loco is going to have a much better answer because he's really good at this. But Yeah, Loco, now you. Uh, and you could also add what it means when you get out of the service and you've had a career of flying aircraft. What does that mean in the job market? Oh, great. Great questions, Jay. And uh, just to add on, to all the great things that Magoo said, but um, exposure, you know, you're, if you are looking for a challenge in life, if you're looking for an opportunity to be the best version of yourself and just to be a part of something that is better than yourself, I say, come on and join the team. Regardless of what, what you think you know you wanna do, just come and join the team um, because you'll be exposed to different people, different missions, various, walks of life, you come as friends, but you're gonna leave, you're gonna be part of the Ohana and leave as family members, and you're gonna make lifelong relationships. The Air Force really prides itself on education. So I think as long as you have the propensity to serve and you have any type of desire to just wanna be a better version of yourself and get better 1% every day, then come on in because the Air Force will definitely challenge you and help you get you to where you need to be and also where you wanna be as well as there are moving opportunities. So if you just wanna see the world, and you may not have the resources to do that on your own, but you wanna join a team, well, come on in the Air Force because we'll figure out what your talents are and find a job for you that's gonna help us optimize your capability to help us accomplish the mission while moving you every couple of years to different locations uh, to increase your depth and breadth and uh, making you that much more better of a warfighter. I think that all helps out with the total person because you're going to build up, build on all these skills, which is going to make you very marketable and competitive out there in the civilian sector, regardless of what it is you want to do, whether you want to start a nonprofit, go into the education system, or go into corporate America, because you're able to rely on those experiences that you've learned from your peers, your subordinates, and your leaders, because the cool thing about the Air Force is that everybody wants to see everybody succeed, and we just want to posture you for greatness whenever it is time for you to transition and take off, like I said, like I started out before, take off the superhero outfit. Yeah, I, you've alluded to this and I wanna, I wanna make my statement now, okay? Um, you know, since the draft uh, was terminated, and I was there when it was terminated in the 70s, and, um, you know, we haven't really had national service and the Peace Corps hasn't been, you know, a robust replacement for it. And um, people go through their whole lives and the only contact they have with the federal government is they pay taxes. Not everybody does pay taxes, but they most of them pay taxes. And so you don't have the same kind of connection that there was before between the ordinary citizen and the country. And so being in the military, I feel very strongly about this, being in the military connects you with the country. It gives you a role. It makes you a, a, a valuable citizen, a citizen who is connected. And I think that's so important, not only for you and all the, the benefits you can get out of being in the service, but for the country. Uh, we need to do that. We all need to do that. So thank you very much for your service, gentlemen. And you're a great team, obviously. And we really appreciate you coming on the show and telling us about these things. Jay, we'll keep the uh, Coast, Guard, Coast Guard joke for later, but we really appreciate your service. And thank you so much for having Loco and I today. Uh, but we, uh, we really do appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Take care. Aloha.